question time. I left extra time today. For questions. And really, it'd have been more time for questions if I hadn't spent five, six, seven minutes on that paperclip example. I'm still, I'm, I'm now hoping that someone will show up at my door and say, we're going to do the paperclip challenge. I want to try this. I want to try. I, I don't know where I would find 100,000 paperclips, but I'll figure it out if and when that opportunity ever arises. All right, question time. Oh. NFL leads. Sorry, PFD Pampas. I don't like your question today. I'm sorry. I, I, I just, I'm not into it, so I'm not going to answer your question today. You ask some good questions. I'm just not. I don't care about Pro Bowl questions. I don't care. I don't care about the Pro Bowl. Don't ask me about the Pro Bowl. Thank you very much. NFL leads. I've been a huge PFT fan since the beginning. Thank you for that. And have always wanted to know who was Dante Alighieri, the guy you originally did podcasts with. That is a long story that would have many chapters that is not suited to a soundbite or a quick answer. One of these days, if there ever is a market for a long-form narrative about how in the hell this whole thing came to be and how in the hell it survived and thrived for as long as it did, maybe I'll tell the story there. For now, I don't even know where to begin. So thank you for the question. Thank you for being around so long that you remember Dante. I'll just leave it at that for now. Kyle Thomas, what do you think the Seahawks will do regarding their upcoming contracts with big dollars? Jamal Adams, Quandre Diggs, Tyler Lockett, to name a few big ones. I, I, I just can't imagine Jamal Adams being with the Seahawks after everything that happened last year. Yes, there's been a coaching change, and maybe Mike McDonald, the new head coach, tries to get through to him, but I remember some of the things I heard back when he was with the Jets. They just decided there's no getting through to this guy. Nothing you say, nothing you do is going to change him. And if anything, I mean, this is the human nature aspect we were talking about earlier with owners. The harder you try to change him, the more insistent he becomes to not changing. And the stuff that went on on social media with the reporter that said yikes after the clip emerged of Adams getting beaten for a touchdown catch against the Cowboys on that Thursday night, the week after Thanksgiving, and then Adams reacted to that and he got personal and then doubled down. And then there was the issue about he was injured and he showed up and did he leave and whatever. I think that as the Seahawks try to move forward with kind of a fresh start, even though GM John Schneider is still there, I can't imagine Adams being on the team. With other guys, there's all sorts of things you can do. You can restructure the contract. They can take a pay cut. There's different things you can do to create cap space. And, and as we said yesterday, the salary cap keeps going up and up and up. Nothing cures salary cap problems like more cap space. And if it really does end up being in the neighborhood of $250 million, teams that thought they were in trouble are going to be in less trouble. And that's why you know, I'm always a proponent of, of kicking the can if you can. Because if you've got a $20 million cap charge to deal with now, if you can find a way to push it into future years, the higher the cap goes, the less that $20 million counts as a percentage of what you have available to spend. So it hurts less if you can move it to future years and you just keep kicking it to future years and you keep kicking it to future years. Unless you get to the point where you've kicked $150 million to future years, then you got a problem. But if you're just taking 20 now and moving it out into the future, it does less damage in the future than it's going to do in the present. So there's all sorts of things the Seahawks can do. If they want to keep digs, if they want to keep lock it, they can figure out ways to do it. That's why general managers get the semi-big bucks. Matthew Reese Baldwin, do you think we'll ever get to a stage where there's an international game every week, barring weeks 1 and 18. 9.30 a.m. Eastern could essentially be another slot on the schedule and give the NFL a chance to own the whole of Sunday. I think it's possible. Now, I don't know that we'd ever see 16 games, but we could because what do we have now? We have the 17th game, which creates the opportunity for 16 neutral site games. I don't know that 16 neutral site games would all be played in Europe. That's how you get the 9.30 a.m. start. But 
You could have a nice cluster of European games, a nice number of weeks that start at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, and then you've got four windows of football. 9.30, 1, 4, 4.30, and then the Sunday night game on NBC. Remember the one time they played the Chargers-Raiders game late night on a Sunday? It was kind of an experiment to see what kind of audience they would have on that window. I never did it again, and I think the audience wasn't great. But they've been happy with the audiences in the morning, and then you carry it through the whole day. And look, it's all about finding more places in the crust of the pizza where you can cram the cheese. Four windows on Sunday, not every week, half the weeks. If it delivers, and if the NFL can sell that as a package, sell that as a separate package to Apple or Amazon or Netflix or whoever, why would you not do it? If people are going to watch it, why would you not do it? At Playoff Cap, what have you truly heard, if anything, about Jim Harbaugh signing Colin Kaepernick to the Chargers? Have you not heard anything because it's not being asked or talked about anymore or because Harbaugh won't do it? There was a time that I think if Harbaugh had been back in the NFL, one of the first orders of business would have been to sign Colin Kaepernick as a player. Two years ago with the Vikings, when there was conversation about Harbaugh becoming the coach, he actually thought he was going to be offered the job. The Vikings didn't do it. One of the questions was, did the Vikings not do it because Harbaugh was going to bring in Colin Kaepernick to the quarterback depth chart? And through the process of trying to find that out, I learned that there was conversation about him possibly being offered a job on the coaching staff as a quarterback's coach or maybe an assistant quarterback's coach. And I think there isn't an assistant quarterback's coach yet with the Chargers. I don't know that that's something that Harbaugh wants to do. All I know is two years ago when Harbaugh was thinking about and looking at and believing he was going to be the Vikings coach, there was some consideration given to the possibility of Kaepernick being offered a spot on the coaching staff if he wanted it, if he was willing to pull the plug on his effort to play. And uh, look, I every once in a while, we hear a comment from Kaepernick that he's still working out however many hours a day keeping in shape and wanting to play. And I mean, regardless of the whys and the wherefores and how we got here and who's right and who's wrong and how this becomes a wedge issue that divides us like so many other issues that divide us, he's never playing in the NFL again. That ship sailed. It's over. It's done. It's kaput. The question would be then whether or not Harbaugh's affinity for Kaepernick would lead to some sort of an opportunity to join the coaching staff if, if that's even something he would want to do. I haven't heard anything about it this time. And the only reason I heard anything about it two years ago is because there was a concern the Vikings didn't want Harbaugh because he was going to bring in Kaepernick. And I looked into it and I was told reliably, as opposed to the things I'm told unreliably, that there was some thought given to possibly adding the coaching staff, but that had nothing to do with what happened in Minnesota with Harbaugh not getting the job. Nicola Filotti, would it be a good idea to get rid of the franchise tag for a player who has played under his fifth-year option so teams would not be tied to a first-round player for six years without an extension? Cheers from Italy, Abondanza. It'd be a good idea from the player's perspective, but the league's never going to do it. See, that's how collective bargaining works. There are certain things that you bargain about, and there are certain things that you don't bargain about. And for the league, the franchise tag is is a non-starter because the franchise tag is the thing that every team has every year to keep the best player who is currently due to become a free agent from becoming a free agent if they're willing to commit the dollars to that player. Plenty of teams don't use the franchise tag in any given year because there isn't an impending free agent they want to make that investment in. But when you got a great player at a given position, you do it. And it's one of the flaws in the 2011 CBA, which was extended in 2020, this system of first-round pick, four-year contract, fifth-year option. You can tag him once, you can tag him twice, and that third tag is the one that becomes ridiculously expensive. So as a practical matter, every first-round pick is looking at seven years before he can go elsewhere. For anyone but a quarterback, you're kind of stuck. I'm waiting for the day that a quarterback says, I'm not going to sign another contract with this team. 
I'll happily continue to play here through the five years of my rookie contract. And if they choose to tag me once and twice, I'll do it. I'll fulfill my obligation. But the moment that year seven ends, unless they're going to give me a 44% bump over my ridiculously inflated second franchise tag, I'm going elsewhere. I'm doing the Kirk Cousins thing. See, that's the way that a player can crack the code on the franchise tag and turn it back around against the team. And I'm waiting for the day that a quarterback with a team that he's content to stay with for seven years, but after my seven years, I'm moving on, says that. Now, it wouldn't make him very popular with the fans or the media, but that's the right that every player has. And at a position like quarterback where the rules protect you, think about it. Seven years in, 28, 29, 30 years old, you're you're still on the front end of your prime. Be interested to see if that happens one of these years with one of these quarterbacks who just decides, you know what, I really don't want to make a long-term commitment with this team. And if they're not willing to pay me after three years, what I should get, I'll just ride it out through seven, and then I'll walk away as an unrestricted free agent. This one is from Tiza. Tiza from New York. What are the chances Tom Brady joins the 49ers this offseason? They said no to him twice, and he rejected them this past season. Brady has said, as well as his camp, that he can go till 50. He can go beyond 50. The arm will be there beyond 50. Now, I think he's done, and I think at this point the 49ers aren't going to revisit it. Last year it was about having a plan A in the event that Brock Purdy wasn't healthy. And even if he was healthy, once you have Tom Brady, he's your guy, and, Tom, and Brock Purdy takes a seat, and that, that was the, the comment that came from Brock Purdy a month or so ago that everyone kind of ignored until MDS saw it. And he was like, you guys see it? Like, this is kind of a big deal that Kyle Shanahan said to Brock Purdy, we're going to try to get Tom Brady. And we've never gotten a straight answer from anyone as to what happened when they tried to get Tom Brady. Now, Sims has said there was a period of time last year that Brady was kind of keeping in touch with potential destinations and he decided he's just not going to play. I don't think he plays in 2024. I don't think he ever plays again, which probably means he comes out of retirement tomorrow. Brady is trying to buy 5 to 10% of the Raiders. And that deal had been bogged down by the reality that Mark Davis, the owner of the team, was trying to sell it to Brady under a sweetheart deal. And it was going to be part of a plan where he's an employee and part of his compensation is equity and That door got slammed last year for any team that would want to give equity to players or coaches. So then it became a dramatically reduced purchase price that the owners don't want because they don't want the equity in any team to be devalued because then that devalues the equity in their own team. So there was a report Super Bowl week that the league is expected to finally approve this Tom Brady acquisition of the Raiders. Remember last year when that first came up, there would be a convoluted approval process that would have to happen to put Brady in a position where he could play even for the Raiders after becoming an owner of the team. So I think what's going to happen is it sure sounds like they're in a position to sign off on Brady, acquiring a chunk of the Raiders, becoming part owner of the team and ending forever any chance of him coming back. And to that point, to that point, somebody asked a very good question about Brady's status as a potential owner of the Raiders and his presence in a Super Bowl commercial for a sports betting company. I believe it was BetMGM. I asked the league about that. The moment that that deal is done, he's got to cut all ties with any type of endorsement, sponsorship relationship with any sports book. It's over. It's done. It's just another example of this weird, mindful field of rules and regulations the league has gotten itself into with gambling. But... As a potential owner of the Raiders, he's allowed to do it. Once that deal is done and he owns a piece of the Raiders, no more sports book sponsorships for Tom Brady. He'll go. He'll have to go back to uh, uh, FTX. Well, FTX, not FTX, but something else. <laughs> something else that is uh, couched as a get-rich-quick scheme. And sometimes you end up getting poor even faster. All right, what else do we have here? Manuel Villa, not totally an NFL issue, but 
Do you see a blowback to cord cutting? It seems like we're getting to a point where keeping up with all streaming services is more than cable, especially if you want to watch other local sports teams. Now, my own experience, and I'm not going to name names, but it's one of the major satellite providers that used to have the Sunday ticket package. I had a hookup in my house, and I had a separate one in my barn, and I was paying a lot of money. Now, I didn't have Sunday ticket in both locations. I didn't go crazy, but it was pretty crazy. The monthly cost to have the barn and the house wired with this major satellite service that had access to Sunday Ticket was nuts. And we switched to YouTube TV several years ago. And I couldn't believe the savings. And it gave me the freedom to have, I think we have pretty much every streaming service. I think we do. Even like... There are some we should get rid of. There are some that we don't watch very often, if at all. We could just get rid of it, and then if it gets a show that we want to watch, we can get it back. That requires a level of discipline that I currently don't have in my life that maybe I should acquire. And I think what we're seeing now, and this happened during Super Bowl week with the announcement of the Warner Brothers Discovery, ESPN, and Fox mega streamer, and more recently the Wall Street Journal reported that Paramount and Comcast were talking about maybe partnering up Paramount Plus and Peacock, which, by the way, is the home of PFT Live. I think that maybe what we're going to see is these various streaming companies that are trying to go it alone and competing for the customers who are picking and choosing and maybe shutting off one and picking up another and then shutting off that one and picking up another and going here and there and everywhere. They combine resources, they cut costs, and they give enough that there's never a reason for the consumer to look around and say, you know what, there's currently nothing on Disney that I really care about watching. I'm going to cancel my Disney Plus subscription until they have something I want to watch. So when you bundle them all together, you're less likely to do it. The price goes up. And basically what we have is a cable setup that is just internet-based, like YouTube TV. So I have a feeling that's where the ball may be moving. It's not necessarily a blowback, but it's just a reality that, you know, the... (laughs) I, I, I don't know if I'm going to get my tr- myself in trouble for saying this. Nobody's paying attention to what I'm saying on this, so I'll say what I want to say. Not that that stops me any other time. But, you know, it's a good thing for the consumer to be able to say, I'll sign up for Peacock and I'll keep it until there's nothing on Peacock I currently want to watch, and then I'll get rid of it. I mean, it's not like you got to sit around your house all day waiting for the cable guy to show up. It's easy. It's easy to cancel these. So I'll cancel Paramount until they have something I want. And I'll spend my money on Netflix. And I'll keep Netflix until I've watched everything Netflix has. And then I'll cycle off of Netflix and I'll go get Hulu. And I'll watch everything on Hulu for a couple of months. And then I'll get rid of that. Wait until they come out with another season of Fargo or whatever. It's a lot of, it's it's a tremendous amount of power for the consumer. And I think the, the content companies are realizing that. So how do you guard against it? You bundle together. So there's never a point where the consumer says, eh, I don't need this. Because to watch the one thing, you got to watch everything. And that's what I used to say about cable. Wait a minute. I'm paying for all these channels and I watched three of them. So now that we have the power to buy the streaming services and cancel the ones we don't want, they're going to bundle them together to take that away from us. Anyway, anyway. And I hope I remain employed after I say that. But really, the thing that we complain about as consumers, oh, I don't want this one. Oh, I don't want that one. You have the power to pick and choose. That power may be going away as streamers, mega streamers become de facto cable companies where you're paying for a lot of stuff. You just don't watch. Tyler Hergert, should the NFL make the field larger? No, no. And. Good luck making the field larger when the stadiums have all been constructed to accommodate the current size of the field. There's no reason to make the field larger. No reason whatsoever. Jordan Davey, should there be just exclusive franchise tags instead of non-exclusive? No team wants to give up two first-rounders for any player, and it would give top players 
more leverage to free agency, but it really wouldn't. It really wouldn't. I, I don't see the franchise tag changing in any way, shape, or form because the NFL doesn't want to mess with the franchise tag. The NFL loves the franchise tag, and there's nothing that the union could offer that could get the NFL to give it up. It gets back to collective bargaining. It's not just a matter of what are you willing to give us up to get this thing that you want. There may be certain topics that are just non-starters. We're not getting rid of the franchise tag. We're not changing the franchise tag. If you want to bargain with us, you bargain over something else. And if you feel strongly enough about the franchise tag that you just won't take it anymore, you're free to strike. And they're not going to strike over the franchise tag. Dr. J, 144, is Deshaun Watson's contract the worst quarterback contract in the NFL, in your opinion? If so, does that validate other teams' hesitation to use it as precedent, or does it still reek of collusion? I I think it can be both. It's a bad contract. The Browns haven't gotten value. The Browns, two years in, they got six games in 2022, which were meaningless. 2023, he was injured multiple times, and now the pressure's on for the final three years of the deal all of which are fully guaranteed. I mean, look at it this way. If the final three years weren't fully guaranteed, wouldn't we be hearing chatter and speculation about the Browns moving on from Deshaun Watson? If they had the flexibility to move on from him, we'd be hearing maybe they'll move on from Deshaun Watson and sign Kirk Cousins or sign someone else or draft someone else. But they're tied to Watson. So it can possibly be a bad deal, but also... Also, the reaction to it and the reluctance of teams last year to pursue Lamar Jackson can can smack of collusion. Both things can exist. Playoff cap, again. Why doesn't the NFL let teams make the whole roster active on game day when teams are already having to pay the salaries? If anything, this would help with player safety, less wear and tear to each player and wouldn't even cost extra money as you're already paying them. Here's the thing to keep in mind. You've got 53 on the roster. You've got 47 who dress. A lot of the guys who don't dress are injured. And that's a way to keep them on the roster without putting them on injured reserve. So, you know, on a lot of Sundays... Most teams wouldn't even be able to dress 53 guys if you were allowed to dress everyone on your roster. Now, I think that at some point we have to talk about expanding the roster and expanding the number of available game day players, and I think that happens if and when the NFL makes a push for an 18th regular season game, and I hope the NFL doesn't. But when the next CBA is negotiated at the end of this decade, early next decade, it very well could be. But but keep that in mind. Even if you say you can dress all 53 of your guys, a lot of the guys who are inactive on Sunday are inactive because they can't play anyway. And there have been occasions, and I think Tony Dungy tells this story, there was a time in Indianapolis where they didn't even have enough healthy guys to dress the number of players they were allowed to dress. So that that's the flaw in the idea of just go ahead and let them dress everyone on the roster. And then you'd have one team with 53, and you'd have another team with 47, And then you create a little bit of an imbalance that way. So I think the effort is to make sure that every team has the same number of available players on game day, recognizing a certain number of the players on the roster are going to be injured, but not so injured that they end up on injured reserve. All right. What else do we have here? I got a couple here that I, I I looked through some of these before, so I'd know which ones to answer. Now I'm getting into the last few that I haven't looked at. I'm going to fly blind on this one from Matthew Takix. When it comes to the new postseason overtime, especially when going up against premier offenses like Mahomes and the Chiefs, for the team getting the ball first, something I'd suggest is not only they need to get a touchdown, but also go for two to call their bluff since Kansas City was going to go for two. Anyway, I've had people ask me that question. What if the 49ers were, were going to go for two and force the Chiefs to go for two to extend the game? and then give the 49ers the first possession of sudden death if both teams had scored eight. That's possible. Now, I tend to think that at some point in this effort to justify why he did what he did, Kyle Shanahan would have blurted out because he's not very good at concealing things. He's not very good at lying, which is an admirable quality. But I think he would have blurted out because the Chiefs had made it clear they were going to go for two on the back end. That's one of the reasons that they wanted the ball second Shanahan could have said, well, we were going to go for two as well. So 
it wouldn't have mattered. They would have been playing for a tie if we would have converted the two-point attempt. But, but that is one of the things you can do. That's what I love about this postseason overtime. You know, it was done to correct the imbalance that comes from winning the coin toss, driving down the field, scoring a touchdown, and walking off without the other team even getting the ball. There's so many different wrinkles and permutations and possibilities. We talked yesterday about the possibility of a surprise onside kick to start overtime. And I can't tell you how many questions I've gotten about that. Folks, if you do a surprise onside kick and recover it to start overtime, you win if you score. The other team has had an opportunity to possess the ball. And if the other team recovers it, they don't win if they score. It's still their possession, period. And some people don't like it. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. And I'm not here to explain why they are what they are. But if you do a surprise onside kick and you recover it, you win with a field goal. If the other team recovers it, it's still their possession. Now, a much better field position, but it's still their possession. And you are guaranteed a possession even if you fail to recover your onside kick. So there's a lot of different things that can happen. And I look forward, I really look forward, to more overtime games in the playoffs because there is a level of strategy and potential chaos that we have barely begun to scratch the surface of thanks to Super Bowl 58. Twelfth man, what's the best way for NFL teams to evaluate a quarterback's intangibles, how hard they will work, film review, game preparation, locker room leadership, and doing what it takes when the game is on the line? College coaches are there for their player, not so sure they provide a complete picture hey this is one of the realities of we don't know what a guy is going to be until he comes to the nfl you know at the college level there's a limited number of hours that the player can even devote to his craft you find out when a guy gets to the nfl how competitive is he and how much of that competitive desire is going to translate to giving your life over to doing everything in your power working every day of the week including tuesdays to <laughs> To be the absolute best you can be. And you set the example for your teammates. You're the first guy there. You're the last guy to leave. It inspires the others. Every team, I think, hopes to have that guy who is the coach among the players. The quarterback who has that way about him that makes the other players not want to disappoint him. I love the Rodney Harrison story. When he arrived with the Patriots after starting his career with the Chargers. And he showed up in the weight room in the offseason at 6.30 in the morning. And Tom Brady said to him when he arrived, good afternoon, Rodney. So Rodney decided, I'm going to come earlier. He comes at 6.15. Tom Brady's there. Good afternoon, Rodney. And it kept going until it got to a point where Rodney Harrison said, screw it, I'm not going in any earlier than this. I'll just deal with Tom Brady saying to me, Good afternoon, Rodney. But that's the kind of maniacal, competitive. And it's a combination of being extremely competitive, but also being willing to do everything that you have to do. And it's unhealthy at a certain point. But you know what? Those are the guys you compete with for championships. So to answer the question, there's no way of finding out until that guy is in an NFL environment. And we see, we see how it manifests itself in his day-to-day life, how he changes his habits, how he adjusts to the NFL, how he realizes that connection between where I am and where I want to be. And you know what? It's true in any other profession. I remember when I was practicing law and I valued my free time and I tried to keep a barrier up between work and non-work. And you get to a point where you realize if you want to be as good as you can be, you got to make sacrifices. And it's true of anything else. It's true of the business I'm in now. And I know that some folks in the younger generation don't want to hear it, but anytime anybody asks me for advice, career advice, and, and they shut down quickly because the first thing I say is, you better be willing to make sacrifices and bust your ass because you can never be as good as you can be at anything you do unless you're willing to put the time in. You can't just want it. You got to back up your desire with sacrifice and get off my lawn. Get off my lawn. I have work to do. All right. Uh, What else do we have here?
Tom Marshall, A Red Zona UK. Is it just coaching, or could the three first round picks given up for Trey Lance have provided the extra talent to get the 49ers a Super Bowl win? We don't know the answer to that question, but we do know that they invested to get Trey Lance, they invested three first round picks and a third round pick. If they didn't want Trey Lance, if they didn't move from 12 to 3, they would have used that 12th overall pick on someone else. They would have used the next year's first round pick on somebody else. They would have used the next third round pick on somebody else. They would have used the third round pick on somebody else. We don't know who they would have been or what they would have become, but we know what Trey Lance became. And I think that it's easier for the 49ers to kind of justify it because at the end of the day, they got Brock Purdy with the last pick in the draft. That kind of loosely excuses the mess that they made by desperately going from 12 to 3 back in 2021 because they finally wanted to solve this quarterback problem once and for all. All right. I got to wrap this up. One more from NFL leads. If you could have had a cameo personalized message when you were a kid, who would you have wanted? Wow. It depends on what age, right? There's probably an age where I would have wanted it to be Gene Simmons or Paul Stanley. There's an age where I would have wanted it to be Chuck Foreman. Chuck Foreman, my original first favorite football player. I discovered the NFL December 23, 1972 with the Immaculate Reception game. But because I had to be a contrarian, I didn't become a Steelers fan. I tripped my way into Minnesota Vikings fandom. And that first year that I discovered football and the Vikings, Chuck Foreman, number 44, was getting it done. So it probably would have been Chuck Foreman until I got to about 12 or 13 and decided that Kiss was the, the hottest band in the world. I would have wanted to hear from Gene Simmons or Paul Stanley. I hope that answers your question. I guess it does. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.